if that bomb had gone off well, upon impact or if, whatever. If it had gone off, according to all, in, all the experts, with the fallout and everything, they said it would have killed everybody from New York City all down the eastern seaboard to the tip of the Florida Keys. Hello and welcome to This Alabama Life. That's our proud name of it. I'm your proud host of this program in which we try to tell positive, uplifting, interesting, and we hope entertaining stories about Alabamians and people from Alabama. Things that they have done, things they are doing, things they are going to do. Andrea Tice is with us as a co-host. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when we're watching this. That's right. Oh, good day. How's that? There you that, go. That's the diplomatic answer. <laughs> Great to have you back. Great to see you again. And this is an interesting story. It really is. I enjoyed every minute of it, getting to learn about this uh, Alabamian who um, has quite a story. We've got a fellow named Earl Smith who lives not far from the Talladega racetrack, who uh, grew up up in the Tennessee Valley. He... Um, well, imagine this. Imagine you get home from work and your spouse says, well, how was your day today? And you say, well, I uh, possibly saved millions of lives in most of the eastern seaboard of the United States. But I can't tell you anymore. But I can't tell you that much even. <laughs> I can't talk about it. That's exactly what happened to our guest this week, Earl Smith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. This is a case of basically secrets in American history finally coming to light, and it involves an Alabamian. And that's what's so amazing about it. And we get to uh, disclose this secret that involves saving thousands, millions of lives. And uh, like so many of these stories, it began uh, on a, a rural area of North Alabama. Uh, it involves a young man who was visiting relatives in Kalamazoo, Michigan, of all places. And he and a friend decide on a lark to go down and talk to an Air Force recruiter. Yes. And from there, it goes to facing a nuclear bomb with some time in between, of course. But that's where we're headed with this story about Earl. Earl, before we get you face to face with an armed nuclear bomb, right. I want to do a kind of a countdown of sorts in your life and take us back, start us out with where, where you grew up in Alabama, okay. and then we're going to go from there. I was born in a little town in Lawrence County, Alabama, called Hatton. Okay. It's on top of a mountain. I mean, we didn't even have a highway through there until I was a senior in high school. Uh, I graduated high school there, and everybody, back in those days, I graduated in 1956, everybody goes to Kalamazoo, Michigan, live around there. So. I, uh, me and a buddy of mine, we go to Kalamazoo, and I had two sisters and brother already lived there. So it was on long, I strike up a friendship with one of the neighbors, uh, kids, and one day, Saturday morning, I said, uh, let's go around town and see what's going on. So we downtown, and this, in the morning, it's pretty early, and, and there was an Air Force recruiter. I said, let's go in there and make him think we're going to join. Okay, that'd be fun. So, oh, okay. so we go in, we go in there and make him think we're going to join, and 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 we leave on the train at at two thirty that afternoon for the processing center. And we get to the processing center. Oh yeah, we enlisted on the buddy plan. Now we're going to get to be we'll be buddies. Well, that'd be good. You go through. Well, my buddy went to California for basic, and I went to Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. You know. So one of more buddy. I ain't seen him to this day or since again. So there went the plan to <laughs> There went the plan, the buddy plan was out the door. But wow. anyway, anyway uh, it went through basic and uh, the first place they sent me was Denver, Colorado, the munition school they called it. Okay. Well at that school they teach you more or less about how to load and unload the munitions and stuff like that. They give you a pretty good background on it and everything, but it was that's basically the the main thing that they do. I came down with a terrible case of, uh, of strip throat. Now, I had, I, I, started, I was so cold, I had uh, three blankets over me and three buddies of mine had big uh, overcoats over me and I was still freezing dead. Well, the luck, as bad luck would have it, somebody was they, they wanted to blow up the barracks. One of the guys who had gone to school was disillusioned, and he had set a, a composition for somehow he'd come in. I, I 
and brought it in with me and stuck it to the barracks and they put a non-electric fuse and the only thing that saved her life was the fuse went out. It had, had, had moisture in it. Well, of course, all the MPs were all in and they found me and I was almost delirious. And so they rushed me to the hospital and I was in the hospital for five days and they couldn't get me. And my temperature was 105 and they got 105, 104 and they couldn't get it down hardly. So eventually they, uh, uh, they got, got it taken care of. Well, later on, it caused me to have, uh, when I went, went to Puerto Rico, it, uh, I wound up with uh, rheumatic heart disease. It was because of a severe cases, what caused it. Okay. So they were going to discharge me. But I, said, I didn't want to cause By that time, I done brought my wife down there. I married and brought my wife and spent all that money, and I couldn't afford to send her back. <laughs> so anyway, we, um, they gave me a desk job taking care of, of top secret documents all that because we these bombardiers would come in and we had these big tech orders uh, or top secret about the bombs and stuff all the nomenclature on so excuse me 10 had been at a time and we had to watch after everything well one day after they they had left one of the pages was missing now i think so i this lieutenant i i uh Work for actually work for. He said, "Ah, you probably burn it up, you know, you, and, because he, his revisions would come in." I said, "No, I don't think so." So I, I said, "I'm on the research," and so I do all this research. Well, come to find out, one of the bombardiers had stole it out, and the way they caught him, he was the first one to take a leave, and they was watching him, and he wrapped it up a message in, in a newspaper and went to Washington, and throwed it out on the Russian lawn, and they they confiscated it, and they got him and sent him off for 20 years, I think it was. So, now, if I hadn't turned it in, if I hadn't reported it, we'd have been in a world of hurt. Yes. But just something told me that. So I'm, well, what I'm hearing you tell me is there was two different cases of you, that first guy in your barracks wanting to blow it up. Yeah, wanting to blow us up. And Absolutely. then another guy was, uh, was uh, fraternizing with the enemy. With the enemy, yeah. Or being what, a spy. Well, what happened, we had started, this is, this is part of the start of my story, we had started the world's first airborne alert with nuclear weapons. It was called Project Sky, uh, Curtain Razor. Curtain Razor. Okay. And uh, every day at one o'clock, a plane would leave North Africa, headed for America, and every day at one o'clock, we'd have a B-36 headed for there. And they would stay over at the Azores, and they got the gambling, that's what happened. This captain had got the gambling and owed so much money that he had to you know, get some money. And that's why he was that's why he stealing was, that yeah, information. Yeah, was doing that other. So, oh, okay. So that was that was scary, and uh, but as a matter of fact, being the first one, the, the president gave us a unit citation. There were fifty-five of them. Got a, got the presidential unit citation. I don't know what ever happened to it, but it's somewhere. Oh <laughs> but, wow! But uh, anyway, then when I uh, uh, I'm stationed down there. And I put in while I was down there for for bomb disposal school, explosive artist disposal school, they call it, and it ended in Head, Maryland. Well, first of all, you have to graduate the school in in uh, Denver for 90 or above average for them to, to chance you uh, flunking out or what have you. Right. Because the Navy had to write a, a check. I mean, the Air Force had to write a check for $102,000 for each student it went through because you blow up a lot of stuff and there's a lot of money spent, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So... So, uh, High cost there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, anyway, uh, I put in while I was down there for for that school in, in in Maryland. Well, it takes it took nearly a year for me to get the appointment, and then uh, you got to sign a volunteer stra statement right then. Well, you know, it's strictly volunteer to your volunteers. But the minute you start to the school, you start drawing hazard duty pay okay. because about four classes ahead of me. Four guys were killed from, they were doing an electric charge and somebody with a, with a, one of those line on jackets static out and it blew up four, four of them. So, oh, wow. So anyway, and before you get out, they fly you down to Eglin Air Force Base and you got to dig up old bombs and stuff and disarm them. Well, I wasn't worried for the least about the bomb, but I was scared to death of the coral snakes. You know, <laughs> that, that, that was terrified. So, so. Uh, Anyway, and they tell you down there, boy, that uh, stuff you had to do, and you know you, you'd have to toe the line. 
But anyway, uh, I I'm scared of coral snakes. Yeah, I've lived buddy. in Florida, but I'm oh. also scared of bombs. Oh, now, really too. How, I'm, how, I'm more scared of the bombs. I mean, they're snakes, and I want the bombs. How did you resolve this? At what point did you just say, "All right, bombs are where I want to go. I'm not afraid of dying." Yeah. I, well, back then, everybody young, you know, getting rec reckless. I just thought, "Boy, well, that'd be fun," you know. Okay. And never really what I might be getting into. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I thought, well, the main thing that, that, that really got me interested, you got extra pay for that. Mm. Two different extra pay, proficiency pay, then you get another step up, man. So, and listen, man, you're making about the same pay as a as a as a captain that's not on flying status or anything. So you make it's pretty good money. Okay, so that, so that, that, that's that was what made extra. my decision. Mm, yeah, okay, that had a lot to do with it. All right, so you're but, in training school yeah, at this point. Yeah, in training and. Uh, no, I hadn't, hadn't got to the, to the bomb disposal school yet, but the minute I get up there, uh, they they take us out. Well, first guy, the guy says to it, said, gentlemen, there's one thing to remember in this business here now, is if you make, you're allowed a mistake, you're only allowed one mistake, and if you make a mistake, don't go, go don't lose your head and go to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to leave right then. I'm, ready, I'm about ready to get to, you know. He said, now, you're, you're here five days, you're on school, eight hours a day, five days a week. He said, all we want you to think about is bombs. If you happen to be paying, playing uh, uh, golf on Saturday, Right, visualizing in your mind, there's a bomb been dropped on this this tee up here, and and, and such and such happens. That's what we want you. To, <coughs> excuse me, think every day. Well, they walked us out in what looked like a twenty acre field. I mean, every kind of had every kind of munition that's been ever thrown, dropped, or projected in the world. I mean, from war. I mean, from a civil war on up, even up to a V two rocket. Well, they didn't have the bigger missiles yet, because that's later on in the phase. So, yeah, the man looks at you, he said, well, now, before you graduate, if you're fortunate enough to, he said, by the way, the, the washout ratio is, is uh, you'll get uh, usually about 35 out of 100 that's already officers, already been to college, flunks out. So that kind of put you on, oh, Lord, I, I just went to high school, you know, I don't, I don't know enough. But anyway, you just live from day to day. They'll, uh, you're in this room, and that, you can't, there's no windows, you don't look out or anything, and, and, and uh, so uh, it, that's, that's all. And they have like a whole, sh one room would have shelves and just uh, projectile fuses, just all different kinds. And, and so then he tells us about all the stuff laying out here. If, you, if you're if you fortunate enough to graduate, you'll not only be able to walk up to me and tell me what country's from, you'll be able to tell me what kind of explosive is used in it, what kind of fusing system, and how to disarm it. And I thought, yeah, sure, okay, buddy. Well, boy, before you leave there, that's, that's one of the easier things you could do. Wow. But they would give you, a, each week you have a hundred question uh, uh, test. And they'd always throw some curveball in there. And I got a kick out of what one guy, he kind of got him back at it. They gave him a, a, a problem and said, uh, a 4,000 pound semi army piercing bomb has penetrated the White House the, the, in the, into the green room. The president is in bed, can't be moved. You know, it's got an anti-disturbance fuse, anti-withdrawal, uh, chemical long delay, <laughs> you know, where it was literally all you had to do is blow it in place. So this one guy wrote down, solution to problem, paint it green. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was one of my favorite things. <laughs> solution to problem. Well, you, you've got to love bomb humor, right? That's right. It's explosive. <laughs> More like whistling past the graveyard, I would think. Yes. Well, as you are hearing, this is a very harrowing story. Um, you have to consider this is 1961. This is less than a week after John F. Kennedy has been inaugurated as president. It is a, uh, a very tense time in the Cold War. And there is quite a bit of speculation among military folks that the Russians are going to try to test this brand new and very young president in Washington, D.C. now. Uh, the uh, Strategic Air Command already had an operation. They called it Operation Chrome Dome 
in which they would literally have airplanes in the air flying a circle from the United States to Europe and back to the United States. The purpose of that was they were carrying carrying nuclear bombs, bombs that could very easily be armed and dropped on Russia should war break out. Uh, Operation Chrome Dome was kind of frightening. Uh, These B-52s had been modified because they were in the air so much, because they were carrying so much fuel for such a long trip. Unbeknownst to the Air Force and obviously the people who were flying those particular bomb-laden airplanes, there was a lot of stress on the superstructure. The wings were actually developing cracks, and that led to a very tragic crash of a B-52 near Goldsboro, North Carolina, Seymour Johnson Airport, or Air Force Base there. And as you hear Earl um, unfold his story, he's only a few months, less than a year, out of his training in, what would you call it, uh, Don, munitions, bomb technology? Yeah, exploding ordnance technology. Okay. And a lot of that's simple, day-to-day, just defusing bombs that uh, or ordnance that uh, they use for practice that doesn't go off. Or places like Eglin Air Force Base where they do a lot of bomb pr- uh, dropping for practice to go down there and defuse those weapons that don't go off. Uh, in the back of their minds, and they're also trained to defuse the big boy, the, uh, the atomic weapons. Well, little did Earl know when he got the call at night that that's what he was going to be facing. A broken arrow, which is what a, a lost nuclear weapon is called. A broken arrow in Goldsboro, North Carolina. When I, when I graduated, uh, I go back down to North Carolina. And uh, I thought, well, this is going to be good. Now, all I got to do once a month, I got to go, go up to uh, go out to the range and set off a half pound block of TNT and qualify for my hazardous duty pay. That's all I got to do. So it's going on a, uh, a couple of months, you know, so three months. Or so. And the next thing you know, nine months after I graduated, I got, I, we'd had, uh, each guy would have, uh, on the base of the four, we'd have one designated day to be on, on uh, uh, stand duty for that night. Okay. Well, I was at home, and uh, I uh, uh, had, uh, and said, had duty that night, and I got a call close to midnight, and they said, uh, there's a plane, it was a tire call, he said, B-52, tail number 10187, coming in with fuel leaks in the Bombay area. Well, I knew that was serious, so I said, I better get out there. So I throwed my clothes on, didn't take time to lace my combat boots up. I just ran the strings around them, tied them off, and had one little old two kid I was over the side. And I headed for the base. Well, the time I, before I got to the base, the plane crashed 15 miles from the base there. And by the time I got to the base, General Moore had a helicopter waiting on him because he only man had first priority, had a broken air. He said, get on board, get on board. I said, what, what is it? I said, I didn't even know it crashed. And he said, get in, I'll tell you. So I didn't have time to get any radiac instruments. I didn't have any time to get any, any protective clothing. I'm just there. Right. And they take me out, fly me out in this helicopter. Of course, we got the light on, but it, but the fire was burning over about a five square mile area. It was parts of plane was everywhere, and uh, so it was the easiest spot to shoot because the chute had opened. And I thought, God, the chute can't be open because one of the main safety features of those bombs is they don't hook the lanyard that pulls the the parachute out until they get in terror. Uh, 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 te- uh, enemy, like Russian or okay. you know uh, enemy territory. Enemy territory. I'm trying to think. Anyway, what happened? The reason it ca- crashed, they had unloaded a lot of fuel on them, but they had they had a problem with was cracks in the uh, wingspan or some of them. But anyway, the right wing sheared off. Wow! And at ten thousand feet, and it was throwing around like that, and it threw both the bombs out. Well, oh, one wow. of the lanyards caught on the plane. That's how to shoot them. The other one straight down went on the ground. The two died in the fire was, uh, was Major Richards was one guy. These are the two pilots? No, the other guy was, was a gunner. Okay. was a gunner on it. And uh, uh, Barnish, Sergeant Barnish was the other guy's in it. But now, actually three died. Major Shelton, something hit him in the back of the head. They thought it killed him. 
and he floated down. Those chutes automatically open when it gets below 15,000 feet. And they found him later uh, impaled in a tree. I mean, this is looking bad when I see that thing. And once and that chute opens, that does that it arm? starts the arming procedure. Yes, starts it starts the step, okay. step. But anyway, uh, when I I got got there when they, when they dropped me down with a bomb, the first bomb, I said, "Get me close. I won't get too close." I said, "It don't matter. You better get me close as you can." So the bomb had a little thin layer of ice on it because it fell from. Uh, it was cold. It was like 10 degrees that night. Okay. And uh, so I rushed to, oh, the first thing the general says, now you can't touch that bomb. We've got to get permission from Atomic Energy Commission before you can do it. I know, sir, that's not the way it works. And here I'm an enlisted man telling this general that, you know. <laughs> that starts to scare me more than bomb. <laughs> so, so anyway, when I get the, he drop, sets me down, I go up and, and, and uh, I chipped a thing I knew where to access door when I opened up. The arm safe switch was on armed and functioning. Now, I didn't tell this for a long time because I was scared I'd get in trouble until my old squadron commander happened to watch one of the movies, uh, a television reporting. And he said, Earl, you said that. I said, no, I was afraid I'd get in trouble. So, but anyway, it was armed and functioning. Well, those bombs are set at the factory. To, they're going to have a delay of up to 46 hours, I think it is, or somewhere like that. So we don't, you don't know where that's setting, but, and the thing about it, no one man can actually work on the bomb by itself. It has to be two men. Okay. So it took an hour and a half before three more guys came from the, from the uh, base to help me. When they had me in the bottom of that hole, I'm down there, a little more comical stuff come up. I'm down in there, I'm reaching and pulling up out of the muddy water. So if I'm pulling up parts of the bomb, I said, now nah, I've got a hold of this such because you learned to feel. But, and I pull up the uranium ball. And I bring it up like this between my legs and I hand it to the guy. I said, well, I probably won't have any more kids. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was serious about it and I never did after that. We had it disarmed within uh, uh, probably an hour or so after, after when they got out. Well. Eight and a half hours now, after the bomb's already ground, we got it, the first bomb taken care of, it's ready to go back to the base. This lieutenant flies in with, with eight or 10 EOD men from headquarters. He flies in, comes in like little Lord Fortinroy, <laughs> and uh, Lieutenant Ravel, and uh, he's and the EOD, hero. EOD, EOD, they were all EOD from what, headquarters. What does that stand for? Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Anyway, eight and a half hours now after it hit the ground is when he shows up. Okay. Well, it wasn't really anything for him to do at the particular time because we had the first mom taken care of it. Well, uh, he, they finally get to work and they're digging in the, in the ground. They dig, the, we look for the first, second bomb and found it. And uh, he and this crew is actually helping with the digging stuff. We're all pitching in looking for stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's not a, you can't do just old hog at it, you got to be careful because there's 92 detonators that are explosive. We had to locate all of those first. 92? 92, 92. That's what sets the, the, the primary uh, part of the bomb off and it shoots down the end of the bomb and encompassing this this thing that, that will miss it. That's what caused the, uh, the, the hydro explosion. Okay. But anyway, uh, they... Uh, they work and they get the afterbody out, and it's muddy down in there and it's still cold. And I, they throw my rear end down, and I'm down in there. I'm the lowest anchored man, you know, and I'm the one that's working the, in the bottom. Well, long about that time, or just a little before, General Sweeney flew in, who was a three star general. This first guy's one star general. Uh, here, first before, just before I went in front, he said, now what'd you do first? I said, well, I'm probably in a lot of trouble. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, General Moore said I had to get permission from Atomic Energy Commission. He said, what? <laughs> I said, yeah. He, he didn't send a word, he turned to his IA and said, get General Moore over here. And I said, oh my God, what's gonna happen? He says, the very words he said, I remember it like yesterday. He said, General Moore, if you don't know this man's damn job, I suggest you, you have him up for coffee and donuts about three times a week, so if you need him, he can explain to you what the hell his job is. 
<laughs> oh, I said, you going back to headquarters and I'm going to be stuck on this base with this general. What's going to happen to me? I'm an airman first class, you know. I thought I was going to end up being airman last class. Uh -huh. so it was over but nothing ever came of it. But, but that was there again. That scared me more than the bomb. The generals, absolutely. The newspaper men, all they finally could, would get in there. But now they couldn't. You used to. They keep them up. But now all they could, had to do is threaten the twenty-five thousand dollar fine. Well, the first newspaper I saw from the local paper. Well, they'd always told us if anybody asks you anything, just tell them you don't know. You don't know. Okay. Well, here comes this big thing out in the newspaper that says, well, I got people out there who don't know what they're doing. I mean, yeah, what are you going to say, you know? Yeah, because you, you got to tell them you don't know. If that bomb had gone off well, upon impact or if, wherever. If it had gone off, according to all, in, all the experts, with the fallout and everything, they said it would have killed everybody from New York City all down the eastern seaboard to the tip of the Florida Keys. It was 250 megatons, which is which is uh, uh, 250 times stronger than the one dropped in Nagasaki and, and the other place. 250 Hiroshima, 50 times stronger than the one. You've seen what damage they did. And they said that's what the estimated damage would be, about killing about 25 million people. 25 million people. Can you imagine? A, a crater the size of Lake Erie. That could have been the outcome. We'll never know exactly how much damage that bomb could have caused. But it definitely would have created a, a tremendous disaster, easily the biggest in human history, uh, an accident. And uh, we also don't know, and Earl didn't know, when he got down into that mud hole and started digging and trying to find the little door that would tell him if the bomb was armed or not, he had no idea if it was going to go off. And when he saw the little A on the circuit board that said the bomb had been armed when the parachute snagged, uh, he didn't know if it was going to go off in four seconds, four minutes, four hours, four days. Four days would have been the maximum right? if it was right. ticking down because if we had dropped a bomb on Russia, we would not want to have given them time to try to defuse it right. before it went off. Right. So, you know, literally it could have blown up in his face. And we have to keep in mind his wife and children were well within the, the range of the folks that would have been killed had that happened. That's right. Yeah. So he managed to defuse the, the bomb with the help of the other men and then, you know, and saved millions of lives. But there was an aftermath in as far as Earl's uh, personal life. Well, as he points out, this didn't end that morning. It went on because there were other the other weapon. They were trying to find parts of that. And he was told that this incident would be classified forever, that he could never tell anybody. Right. And he even... Uh, mentioned when I talked to him about the threats, the very serious threats of you being spending time in prison, a long time in prison, if you let it out. So that's the undercurrent in his life as he's dealing with personal problems with his wife. Further down the road in his life, as he's sitting on this secret, he finds out someone else is trying to uh, claim credit, steal the thunder, stolen valor, whatever you want to call it. And he has to deal with that uh, further on down the road. So we'll hear about that next. What, what did they say to you to um, really uh, secure your silence about the whole thing? Well, I mean, they said, you don't mention anything about this. You forget everything you saw. You tell them, we found everything. And uh, you will spend many, many, many years in prison if you ever mention it. So they did threaten so, you Oh, with yes, prison? they did. Oh, yes, you bet. So that was... <laughs> that was pretty good. And you're not you're not it. even allowed to tell your wife. Not to tell anybody. You don't right. tell us so. I was out there almost four months while they were digging. I was out there like the first week I think about eighty two hours, and next week about eighty one or seventy something. Double time. We're more or less standing by in case they found something. And uh, my wife, she started running around on me. You know, and, and uh, but. I can imagine how miserable I must have been coming home, eating them cold sandwiches. I was probably one of the most pleasant to, to live with. And one day I come home, and the phone rang. I was sitting at the kitchen table, and I reach it. And this lady tells me, she said, if you don't stop your wife from running around with my boyfriend, I'm going to do it. I said, I'm sorry, you got the wrong number. She said, this is Earl Smith. And I said, yeah. Your wife's name Rachel? Yeah. No, I don't have the wrong number. Well, I started looking out. And sure enough, 
there's a little motel out in that area out there before where uh, close to where the bomb site was and uh, I and let's see I was I was I was coming I'd gone to base for something I was in the, the truck and uh, and I met her car she was coming you know oh. and, and then he I thought oh don't let me see and then he was right behind her oh no and it was obvious where you was know, going okay. I turned that old truck around and I worked in the top secret area and I had a 45 pistol in my safe there. Well, them boys, you, you had to trade your regular flight line pass to get the Red X top secret pass. And they all knew us and everything, but they said I was wild eyed. I come in. When I got that pistol, they wouldn't let me out again. Because I'm proud of this day that they didn't, because yeah. they'd been one, two, two dead folks there. They, they knew something yeah, was they up. knew something was Okay, down. wow. But uh, we ended up. Uh, uh, after after we, all that time was waiting, uh, and the, my, my squadron commander gave me emergency leave, and this was kind of comical too because I'm going to go back home and get a, a divorce. So I went back to Alabama, and I'm an all lawyer's office. He said, "What grounds are you going to use?" I said, "Mental cruelty." He said, "You can't get a you can't get a divorce in Alabama on mental cruelty." I said, "Really?" He said, "What? Are you, he said, it's got to be physical cruelty. She ever threaten your life or anything?" So, I thought, well, let me see. Well, one time we'd gone bowling. We had we dropped the kids off at the nursery, and we come back and we picked the kids up. And uh, back in those days, they used little plastic baby bottles. And I'm having to concoct this story. Get me, I got to get a divorce anyway. <laughs> and we start back out, and I'm driving, and she, I'm kidding her about a bowling score. She said, "Oh, you?" And she threw that bottle. It was empty, you know. <laughs> he said, "I said, yes, yeah, she hit me with a bottle one time." Old lawyer back. Said, oh, really? Said uh, you didn't figure that. He said where'd she hit you? I said right across the neck, kind of. He said you figure you, that endangered your life. I said yeah, I was driving a car pretty fast. I almost had a wreck. He said, that's good enough. That's how I got my divorce. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get some come up. What did she do when she read that? Did she? Well, it was uncontested, you know. Oh, okay. It was uncontested. If it had been contested, I'd been problem. But I knew, <laughs> yeah, I had a boy, I was the fastest I've ever think up a story. <laughs> Part of it was true. It was a hit with a bottle, it was, but it was a plastic bottle. <laughs> and, but anyway. And, and what's ironic is that you're writing down all of this made up danger right but here mm -hmm. you were disarming a nuclear yeah. bomb yeah for real you couldn't say anything about that yeah <laughs> i was talking to some guys at as anison ordnance depot they dropped all kind of bombs in this and over the years and they were cleaning it up so there were a lot of eod men out there and i was working my job selling rvs and um uh, one of them come in this is years later yeah years yeah. later yeah and uh so uh I said, well, I worked, I worked a little job one time. I used to be EOD. He said, where at? He said, said, North Carolina. Well, there was two guys. One looked at me and said, North Carolina? I said, yeah, uh, uh, Goldsboro. He said, you worked on the Goldsboro? I said, yeah, sure did. I said, but, you know, I can't talk about it other than the fact that it happened. He said, no, he said, you, you can talk about it. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's all over the Internet. I, I thought it would never be mentioned in my lifetime. It was just this pure accident that, that I haven't be talking to those guys. Of course, eventually I would have found them, but I wasn't much on the internet doing all that much myself. Cause I, you know, cause you had to be looking for it. So, and so at some point it had been declassified to the point yeah, that they Yeah, after 50 years they 50 declassified, years, okay. yeah, yeah. All right. They declassified it, so. But that, that was a relief to be able to talk about it. Right. I get to start pulling up on the internet, man. This lieutenant's telling all this stuff he had found out. The well, other three guys had already passed away, and he thought I was dead, too. Okay. So he proceeded to tell the story like he'd done what, everything that I did. And they, he forgot that all the other people knew about it, you know. So he, he was going to be the hero. R Ravel, Jack Ravel is his name. It's Dr. Jack Ravel now. He's making the claim that he was the one. Oh, yeah. He's, 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 actually... Oh, he had it right down the T. And, well... This guy had written a book. That book I got right over there, uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, Broken Air Over Goldsboro. He, he wrote the book about this, and nothing was said. He just wrote whatever, whatever Revell told him. Nothing was said about me and the other three guys that worked on the bomb. Nothing. But this guy, I mean, he just he just thought, they were, he thought I was dead and thought the other three were dead, and he could just get by with anything that... 
And, but that made my blood boil when I found out what, what he was doing. I said, those three guys are dead. You got no way to defend them, you know. Right, and they- So all the way long, yeah. The, the guy's name was Sergeant Fletcher, uh, John Fletcher, that's one of his, his son that gave me the book. Joe Fincher and uh, Tobert Evers were the other three guys that helped me. Oh, and I got, I got to show you this book here. Uh, a, a picture in it, and, and it explains it, and then the bottom, yeah, right here. Uh, he, uh, it's called Bombs. Don't buy it because it's a bunch of crap. <laughs> but let me show you what, okay. what to, to, to illustrate to you. <laughs> yeah, now right here is a picture. Well, that shows the bomb there. But now here's a picture right after you come out of the hole. Now you see this gentleman on the bottom here? Yeah. It says Earl T. Smith in the old muddy thing. Yeah. Uh, he says Lieutenant Nimmo. Now you think he was in the hole? Yeah, right. Yeah, obviously, I don't know who's in the hole. Yeah, you've got all the, yeah. the dirt from the yeah. hole. Yeah, so that's who, <laughs> who was in the hole. And, uh, wow. But uh, Joel Dobson's the guy that, that recorded that. But I told him, I said, well, now, you know, if he told you that, and I, I'm not holding it against you, but I said he lied like a dog. That's as simple as I can put it. So we've reached the point where the record is finally getting set straight. Not out of malice, but because Earl wants to honor those other three men that went into that mud hole with him, as well as himself, of course, to get some credit for what they had done. That's right. And uh, he also found in this a way to maybe remove some of those demons, the way that he could honor those three compadres of his who... Uh, had predeceased him in, in this whole thing. Yes. And, you know, he mentioned in that interview, he had no idea that he would ever be able to talk about it. And now he's not only talking about it to us, but he has um, other venues and um, organizations that have reached out to him for the story. And then, the, of course, the um, screenplay that's in the works that we hope will will go further. And, and in, in the spirit of full disclosure, which I seem to use a lot on this podcast, <laughs> uh, I am involved in an effort to help tell Earl's story and those uh, the story of the other three men that were with him that night. So it, it's, I'm glad that I got to be a part of, after all these years, finally recognizing a hero, and a hero here in Alabama, and, uh, you know, something that he deserves after all these years. When I found out about it, uh, I had called... Somebody had named him, there was a guy, Kirk Keller, I think, was doing, would, would head up the Historical Society. Okay. So I called him up there, and he said, yeah. I said, uh, is there any way you can make a trip up here? He said, we'd like to talk to you about this thing. And uh, so finally, anyway, I go up there, and I said, well, I, okay. I said, they'll probably put a little thing in the newspaper. Well, Lord, we've done the whole front page, three pages, and a newspaper article in the, the News Argus, and then three of these big TV shows uh, uh, the guy comes up and uh, matter of fact I got one of the six minute d deals there from WRAL in Raleigh. Anyway, uh, they uh, this guy, Kirk Keller, and I mean he's a super fine person. I mean he what he wanted to do was set the record straight and they already knew, too many people already knew what the story was. and. Uh, he said, we're going to do this right for you because you need to go. So we go through that time and everything. And then when I, when I get back home, about two weeks later, my phone rings, and it's a movie producer from, from uh, Paris, France. I said, how did you get my number? He said, well, uh, from the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Keller there at the uh, Historical Society gave it to me. He said... Uh, he said, well, I wonder, could, could I get you to go back up to, he said, I'm bringing my crew, I'm flying my crew, I'm doing, I'm making a movie called The Cold War, and I won't tell you a story in it. He said, can you come back in April? He said, I'll pay all your expenses and everything, if you will. Okay, so anyway, he, uh, he comes back, and, and, and I go back up. I said, well, I don't want you to have to pay for a fair airline. I said, I'll just drive up there. But he bought all the motel, mm -hmm. benches and everything, my food and everything else, and then played me some extra. But anyway, he, he was from France, and, I, you know, I, I got a little bit of comic in me along the line. So Just a little? Yeah. yeah. I, I said, I speak a little French. He said, oui? I said, yeah. <laughs> Pas de Francais, Chevrolet Coupe, Butte Riviera, and boy, he just looked at me and walked away. He didn't have no sense of humor. I never tried any more of my French after that. 
<laughs> but, but his name, Thierry, uh, I can't pronounce his name, it's uh, uh, two different names. That, but anyway, they, they made this film. He said it'll be showing in Paris and uh, BBC and people like that. And he said eventually it's supposed to show here in, on uh, National Geographic. Don Keith had working on a movie for me uh, called The Man Who Stopped Thunder. Oh. Now, I, I can't stop lightning, but they said it's a man who stopped thunder. And uh, I want everybody to come see it and they get it out. Yes. Because I need the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we'll get you the recognition. I'm not sure about right, the money, but right, we'll, yeah. we'll see if that comes to right. Senator Richard Shelby is, has put you in for a Congressional Medal of yeah, Honor, right. but that's not transpired yet. So tell me about how you got that from a, a lady in North Carolina. Well, he had uh, also sent me in for that flag. He sent me that flag flown with the Capitol in honor. But now I was staying in the hotel when, when I went up there for this thing, and, and this black lady had uh, lost her home and everything to flood. And uh, so we become friends while I was in there and everything. And she asked me, she said, well, have you got a medal for that? I said, no, I haven't got any medal. Well, the next day, she comes in with this. This little handmade thing. Here's a lady, a black lady, a little black lady, lost everything that she had, and she makes me this. And I've been more proud of this than anything that I've got. You've told us an incredible story, and we're yeah. really glad that we that you did. Yeah, we're glad yeah. to share it. I was just doing my job. Yeah, that, that's what I was paid to do. Right. And uh, I was scared to death, absolutely. At times, I was wondering, what am I doing here? But, but uh, you never know until you somebody they drop you out in the middle of nowhere, and, and, and the whole world seems like me on his shoulder. Yeah, but it's it's an incredible feeling. Incredible feeling, but I'm glad that they got it out now to where the people know about what happened and the possibility of it. Because President Kennedy had only been in office four days, and that was his first uh, press conference that he had to talk about. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, four so days, and he four was days. already. He was just, just elected, yeah. Mm. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah, it happened January, January the uh, uh, 24th, 1961. I have to admit, even though I made up the title, The Man Who Stopped Thunder, it fits the situation very well. Yes. That's a screenplay that I've written with my writing partner. And by the way, I want to thank very much Matt Coulter. Matt is a, a local media personality who first introduced us to uh, Earl Smith. Matt also is the public address announcer at the Talladega Racetrack for all the oh, races, and okay. he knows Earl through that. But okay. uh, that, that was a big help. I'm always looking for stories, just like we are here on this Alabama Life. But uh, to hear Earl's story is, is truly amazing. A man who literally could have saved millions of lives. Now, we'll never know. The bomb could not even necessarily have been in a countdown sequence, but he still had to go into that hole and dig that thing out and defuse it. And, and to, him, to hear him tell it, all in a day's work, right? And I still like the fact that he says he was more scared of the officers and his wife than he was <laughs> That's of right. this uh, multi-megaton <laughs> atomic bomb. That uh, title, by the way, comes from uh, a piece of scripture in Exodus, Exodus 9. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease. Oh, wow. I could... It, it just jumped out at me and, and seemed like the, the perfect title for this. The Man Who Stopped Thunder, Earl Smith from over at Lincoln, Alabama. That's our show for this week, our podcast. We hope you'll continue to watch. We hope you'll seek us out. And even better, give us a review. If you think we deserve five stars or a thumbs up or a share, please do that. Uh, an easy way to tell people to find us simply is to go to the 1819news.com website or just do a quick search for our channel on YouTube, on iTunes, on uh, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Tell people about us. Oh, a Facebook page, too. You can actually watch these on, your, on our Facebook page for This Alabama Life. We hope you'll do that. We hope you'll join us next time for This Alabama Life. This Alabama Life.